All right, welcome everybody to our webinar here at Blue Startups. Hopefully you can all hear us and see us and I can see people are, are coming on to this show. So I'm gonna try, don't hurt me if it doesn't work out. I'm gonna try to show a little video to get us started. All right. Welcome to our webinar. We're going to be talking about sustainability and climate tech and all that good stuff. I'm Shenwa Farnsworth. I'm the managing partner at Blue Startups. If you're not familiar with Blue Startups, we are a venture accelerator here in Honolulu, Hawaii. And we invest in and mentor startup companies, both from Hawaii and from the Pacrim region. We do focus on a few things. So we look for companies that are in the sustainability uh, sector, also uh, software and uh, travel and tourism sectors. Uh, we look for founders that are either Hawaii-based, Hawaii-connected, ideally, or from the region, so PACRIM, uh, including North America and Asia. Um, and of course, really love to see female-founded companies. I have two of my female founders here today, yay. Um, we have been in business here for nine years in Hawaii. We have invested in 99 companies. Our first company uh, went public last year. That was really exciting. Got to go to New York City and ring the bell and the NYSE with Volta Charging. I expect that from all 99 of my companies, um, but uh, you know, we'll get there slowly. slowly. Um, so that's a Blue Startups. We are recruiting now for our 14th cohort. Our applications can be found online at bluestartups.com. If you're interested, uh, we invest up to $100,000 into each company, and the program is three months long. It's six weeks in Honolulu, six weeks virtual, and one week in San Francisco. All right, so I'm going to get started with introductions. I'm going to have my fabulous panel introduce themselves so I don't screw it up. I'll start with Murray. Murray, go ahead and introduce yourself. Yes, uh, my name is Murray Clay. Aloha, everyone. I'm the president of Ulupono Initiative. Ulupono is an impact investing firm that tries to improve the quality of life for people here in Hawaii by increasing local food production, renewable energy, and clean transportation. We also do try to improve the management of fresh water and waste as well. So those are kind of our sectors. We work both in investments, nonprofits, uh, also regulatory and policy work. So we're kind of a, a multi-tool entity. Good to awesome. be here. Thank you. And Ulupono Initiative has been a great partner to Blue Startups over the years. So very appreciative of their support. Um, and uh, we'll hope to keep working with them. Um, Candice, go ahead and introduce yourself. Hi, I'm Candice Dietz, co-founder and CEO at GiveSpace, Blue Startups alumni from cohort 13. So we just wrapped up November of 2021. So we're still fresh off the blue. Um, it's, it was an incredible experience. And GiveSpace is a software platform that helps businesses um, create their give back components of, to meet their social responsibility initiatives. So we're in the sustainability space um, with social responsibility. Awesome. Thank you, Candice. All right, Lauren, go ahead and introduce yourself. Hello, everyone. I'm Lauren Rothbeno. I am the founder and CEO of Free Our Water. I'm also a alumni to Blue Startup, part of the, uh, I guess, cohort 12. It's hard to believe. It's been a couple of years now. Um, and uh, I've basically been in the water sector for over 20 years, and specifically uh, Free Our Water. We help cities adapt to climate change by collecting stormwater metrics, and importantly, also engaging uh, property owners to be part of the solution. So we, we have a mobile and data platform 
that helps them um, identify solutions to capture stormwater on site. So great to be here and looking forward to the discussion. All right, thank you, Lauren and Amanda. Aloha, everybody. I'm Amanda Ellis. Where I have a couple of hats, actually. One is as Executive Director for Asia Pacific for the Global Institute of Sustainability, and the other is Lead for Global Partnerships at the Julianne Wrigley Global Futures Laboratory at Arizona State University. And the idea is to help create just and resilient global futures based on sustainable values. All right. Always, always a mouthful for Amanda has to introduce herself with this. <laughs> Very long sentence, um, and I love the way you said laboratory. I'm gonna I'm gonna say it that way from now on. <laughs> How do you Americans say it? Laboratory, I think. Oh, laboratory, <laughs> yeah, we say laboratory. laboratory. I'm from Aotearoa, New Zealand. Everybody. Yes, um, and Amanda has been also really helpful with Blue Startups. She's been involved in our East Meets West events for uh, over the years, and also as a mentor here in our sustainability space. So very thankful to have her here today. All right, so let's get our discussion going. I wanna start with the uh, kind of where we're at today um, question, right? So we've had two years of the pandemic. And one of the things we saw during the pandemic is actually the global emissions for the first time ever started going down. Um, now what we've seen as we're all coming back online and in person and all of our usage of everything's going back up that we're just coming right back to where we were so that, you know, perhaps no real progress was, was made there. How do we kind of get back to that place where we're actually, you know, uh, making progress and reducing emissions? That's kind of my big question to you guys. I know you don't have to have the answer, but let's just talk about some of the things you've been thinking about in this area around reducing emissions and how we get there from here. Uh, Amanda, we'll start with you since uh, you're on our screen here. Okay, and you're going to have to stop me talking because this is really something I'm extremely passionate about from my previous role as ambassador to the UN. So in 2015, the Paris Accords were agreed on by 195 countries. And to actually meet the commitments, we need to halve emissions. Well, actually, it's 48% lower by 2030. So you make a fantastic point, Schnorr, where we are now ramping back up and headed in the wrong direction. Now there's two dimensions I see. One is around the drivers that are coming from the policy world and they're not nearly enough. And I'm gonna talk a little bit about investors. So on the policy side, interestingly, Article 6 at COP, which is the Conference of the Parties on Climate Change, uh, COP26 did finalize the carbon markets. So that's a big incentive to start lowering emissions, right? And the carbon markets doubled since then. And there's both a compliance and a voluntary, but we can go into detail later. So that's one step in the right direction. But when we look at subsidies, and as an economist, I'm always looking at what creates incentives. If you look at both direct and indirect subsidies to fossil fuels, they were $5.7 trillion in 2020, which is international monetary fund data. It's crazy. If we're paying people to do the wrong things, they're going to continue doing the wrong things. So I think we really need to get the policy framework right. We need to be putting a lot more investment up front from government into sustainable solutions. And we need to stop subsidizing fossil fuels. My other point is around investors. So Larry Fink and BlackRock really made history a few years ago, 2019, when he and the Business Roundtable 200 came out and said, shareholder is not enough. We've got to go with stakeholders. Mm -hmm. And that has really spawned a whole movement. Uh, and I can talk about this more. I don't want to hog the floor. But I think seeing investors really taking note, and many of you will have seen the Securities Exchange Commission came out on March the 21st with proposed climate disclosures for US public companies, scope one, scope two, and scope three. And of course, scope three is supply chain. So for small companies getting started, thinking about wanting to be in supply chain of big companies, this is the time to be really conscious. And that will be a positive incentive. So it's great to see the positive incentives coming from business and from the SEC. Mm -hmm. Yeah, those are great points. I, I, I also thought this, um, move by BlackRock was so Im impressive. Um, I'm wondering, Candice, if you have comments on that, I mean, this is right up your alley with 
regards to engaging that stakeholder in, you know, socially responsible, you know, activities and uh, really thinking about business in, in a whole different way. Do you have any comments on that? Yeah. And, you know, I was just, um, I wanted to touch on this point. And so many times when we think about sustainability, we think about natural resources and um, environmental issues, but we fail to think about social and, and economic resources as well. And I think that needs to be part of the conversation. And that's what um, GiveSpace is really focusing on is that social responsibility piece. Sustainability means, you know, meeting our own needs without compromising the ability of our future generations to meet their needs. So when we look at that, um, we see such a segmented approach currently, right? Governments funding, corporations funding, nonprofits funding, individuals funding into these social programs, but we don't see a 360 approach. And that's kind of, um, you know, the missing ecosystem, I feel like, where we all need to kind of come together to work on these issues. And, um, and that's what GiveSpace is doing right now. So we're really excited um, to work with our partners from all different angles and um, verticals and uh, the future is looking brighter. <laughs> yes, you, at least you're getting a lot of engagement there. So that that I think bodes well. Murray, I'd love to get your thoughts. How do we how do we get these metrics moving back in the right direction here? Well, I thought about it since our work is focused purely on Hawaii. I thought about it in terms of what specific things can we do in Hawaii to reduce emissions in the near term. And we, we really need to make up for a lot of lost ground that we lost during the pandemic. And the good news is before the pandemic, we had two massive RFPs, requests for proposals for renewable electricity. So big utility scale wind and solar projects here in Hawaii. And nearly, not all of them, but the vast majority of those projects, hundreds of megawatts of renewables was delayed um, significantly by the pandemic, either directly by the pandemic in terms of health and, and protecting the workers or indirectly because of supply chain. Mm -hmm. So we need to get those hundreds of megawatts of renewables back on track quickly. We need to speed the interconnection process and that could be a significant reduction in greenhouse gas emissions just in the next few years if we can get that moving again. Uh, a piece of good news is during uh, right before the pandemic and then we finished it during the pandemic, we did this docket called performance-based regulation, which gets the utilities incentives aligned with folks that want to adopt renewable energy, it gets it aligned with the environment, essentially. When you do good things, you get paid more for doing what you should be doing. And so we got the incentives right for the utility, which makes them an active partner and an active participant in, in making that happen. And now we're working on, and sorry for being in the kind of nerdy uh, regulatory land here, but now we're on what's called the integrated grid planning or IGP docket, which is the plan to get to 100%. So it's very easy to set a goal, but what's the plan to get to 100%? So we need to accelerate those projects, get to 100%, have a smart plan. And luckily now we have the incentives in place to do that. So I'm hoping things really start picking up as those restrictions from COVID go away. Yeah, yeah, well, that is, that is good news. Lauren, do you have additional thoughts or comments here? I definitely think most of uh, the key items have been mentioned. I, I certainly agree that leadership um, on both the policy, policy side and where the money's coming from is a huge aspect of how we are going to create action in a quick, swift way, because that's basically what needs to happen right now. Um, and I think the only thing that's kind of left out here is the discussion of, of nature-based solutions. I mean, you know, we talk about, um, you, know, so, you know, not only protecting our natural resources, but we are continuing to urbanize and continue to increase in demands. And so nature-based solutions are basically recreating, um, putting in trees, putting in actually stormwater solutions as well. In the meantime, these systems are actually also drawing down carbon. And so I think, again, if we can think about looking at solutions that are holistic and maybe have multi-benefits, we can create more bang for our buck, if you will, when we start rethinking infrastructure, not only on the carbon mitigation side, but also on the climate adaptation side, which I think is becoming increasingly more important because we're starting to see the real ramifications. Unfortunately, I, I personally don't think we're going to be able to reset where we were in terms of carbon numbers. Um, so we need to also we need to slow it down and mitigate. But it's really critical that we also start adapting today. Mm -hmm. And that kind of leads me to my next question, which is, 
you know, this, this whole uh, area is not just about renewable energy. It's kind of how we used to think about climate tech, right? We just need to replace these energy sources with renewable energy sources. Um, but now it's about a lot more than that. So, you know, Lauren is working on water issues. Candace is working on socially responsible issues. Um, you know, so there's a lot else that goes into this. I know Murray's been very active in mobility issues. Um, so, how else do we need to innovate here? You talked about these nature-based solutions. Um, what are some other innovations that we need to see to really move the needle beyond just our energy issues? Um, who wants to talk to that? Well, I'll let you guys decide. Huh? I All can right. just jump Lauren. In and yeah, you go. It, maybe it leads into what I was gonna say. Um, mm -hmm. Because I mean, I think I mean, going back to COP26 too, I do think there was a lot of discussion about obviously, um, you know, getting the mitigation piece right and getting the drawdown right, right? But there was also a huge discussion about adaptation and there's water is, is there's no better um, aspect of how we're actually seeing climate change than water, right? We're seeing it through and, and more directly through how rain is moving and then how are we managing rain and then our whole water cycle re, uh, related about how we're managing it. So, you know, we'll see droughts and flooding. Um, we're seeing, you know, other types of um, groundwater impacts. And actually it was World Water Day this week and was focusing, the United Nations was focusing on groundwater, celebrating that, but also recognizing that we're also depleting um, our groundwater supplies through, you know, more and more development, um, increased demand, but then we have these climate change impacts. And again, the whole, whole reality of what we're seeing of the impacts of climate change is all about water. It's, it's what's in our face and what we're actually seeing. And so the, the, it is the time and space for us to think about how we're going to innovate in the water sector. And I, I personally think rain and storms are kind of the big ones right now, right? Because that's what we're seeing, um, kind of the big impacts uh, relating to climate change. So how can we be smartly thinking about, um, you know, making sure that we can capture that rain and going back to nature-based solutions, being one of those ways that we can do that in a decentralized way to be able to filter that water, get it back into the ground, or importantly, reuse it. And there's a sort of something called the urban water cycle. We can begin to mimic how the water cycle would work in a, where it was pre-developed and mimic that in our new development. That's the new age of infrastructure for our cities. And so there's a lot of, um, you know, not only nature-based solutions, how are we digitizing water? How are we tracking our metrics when we're actually making action? And that's across the board, I think, in sustainability, how do we measure how successful the um, program is, is going? And then importantly, how are we building human capacity? How are we making sure that we're not just throwing everything um, onto a city munis municipality agency? What, what can we give to individuals and communities to also work with, to also adapt to? So there's a lot of innovation opportunities, I think, in that space. Yeah, yeah, uh, that's great. You've covered a lot. And I see water is such a huge component. And I think many people don't connect the dots back to climate change and the issues regarding water. So it's really important for us to think about that. What are some other sectors of innovation that we're seeing in, in climate tech that are interesting or going to move this needle? Murray? So if I can jump in there. Oh, okay, go ahead. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, that'd be fantastic. Just wanted to talk about carbon drawdown and that there are now technological solutions for drawing CO2 out of the atmosphere. And we're about to put up the first mechanical tree on campus at ASU, which has been designed by Klaus Lochner, who actually wrote the Nobel uh, Prize winning paper on drawdown over 10 years ago. So it's exciting to see now there are four big companies globally. And in Iceland, we've actually seen uh, carbon is being drawn out of the atmosphere and being put down into uh, basalt, which is turning into limestone. So it's permanent sequestration. And the point that Lauren made about we've actually, we're going to have to use every means we have. So while the nature-based solutions, I agree, are so important, we are needing to look at technological solutions too. So it's interesting to see the different kinds of drawdown. Ours is passive air capture using solvents, whereas the one in Iceland with Climeworks uh, uses a lot of geothermal energy to rem to, so that it's not also contributing to, to the problem. So interesting just to see these kinds of tech, which uh, I'd love to see more of as well. Yeah, I mean, I think, I know this is a big debate, right? Can we 
draw it down or do we need to reduce emissions? Obviously we need to do both, but I think, you know, people love to take a side on this issue, right? In terms of what's gonna, what's gonna be the bigger impact. Um, and so, you know, the, the debate rages on, I guess. And I guess it's also where you put it once you draw it down. So mm -hmm. you can put it into geological formations, mm -hmm. but then could you, you know, can you put it in concrete and make green concrete? I know there's been some inroads in that, but we need to be able to find products to actually yeah. sequester the carbon in for enough time, carbon fiber, I guess. And there could be a whole interesting sustainable tech sector looking at how to sequester at least to get us through this decisive decade because if we don't make these changes we're going to tip over 1.5 degrees and the scientists predictions are really catastrophic yeah and what i hate to hear are people saying oh we don't need to worry about reducing emissions because we're going to figure out how to capture and and you know sequester all this carbon so that that you know seems to be the big uh, get out of jail free card that um is really probably not coming anytime soon on the scale that it would need to. Um, other thoughts about innovation? Yeah, Murray, go ahead. Yeah, you know, I'll continue the theme from Lauren and Amanda that we really need every tool in the toolbox. It's not nature-based or technological-based. We absolutely have to have everything on the menu because of the size of the problem is so large. When we face that kind of debate, um, even within renewable electricity. Some people think we can get there with just solar or just wind, or they just want to pick their favorite tool and say, let's just do that. And if you do the math, no single tool will even come close to solving the problem. It's everything. It's full court press all the way. So that said, I will also share a technological example like Amanda did, um, just because that's a little bit more my specialty. But uh, energy storage, there's been great technological improvements in energy storage, which helps us in two ways. One is with grid storage, so making that wind and that solar more firm. And then the other thing is, of course, electric vehicles and transportation. And the, what you're seeing is the cost of batteries, which used to be extremely prohibitive, is starting to come down now, sort of at the same rate solar started coming down in prices, say, about 10 years ago. So there's kind of like a 10-year lag. Mm -hmm. But the batteries are coming down now that you're seeing significant amounts of grid-scale storage. You're seeing lots of EVs. I mean, on the EV front alone, it's really exciting. When I first got my, my first EV about eight years ago, really, and, and sorry if I'm uh, you know, giving a, a free commercial here, but the only thing that I, could, I could really pick from was really the Nissan Leaf back then. There was a few other things, but it was really just the Nissan Leaf, and it's a great car. But this year alone, there's going to be 30 new EV models, including 14 SUVs, a van, and four pickups. So it's not just the wonky little you know, economy car anymore. There's all kinds of stuff coming out. Certain auto manufacturers are pledging to go 100% EV in the next you know, 10 years or so. Uh, we see the state starting to adopt EVs. Um, there was the EV as a service model that was recently adopted by the state so that they can pay for EVs on a per mile basis, which saves them a lot of money versus gasoline vehicles. Mm -hmm. So they're realizing those savings for maintenance and fuel because we do know EVs are so efficient. So there's a lot of good news on the EV front. Uh, but also just wanted to throw a plug in there that I don't want to be like the guy that says EVs are the answer for transportation, because we also learned from the pandemic that sometimes you don't need to drive as much as you think you do. I mean, maybe the hybrid work <laughs> holds and we don't need to commute as much. Maybe we can walk more, bike more, and look for active modes of transportation that are less emitting. So I think we learned some good lessons in the pandemic that maybe we don't need to drive as much as we thought we did. And to the extent that we do, now you've got a lot more EVs to pick from. Yeah, absolutely. My husband has been waiting with bated breath for that VW bus, the electric VW bus to come out. He just cannot wait to get his hands on that thing. Um, uh, Candice, do you have anything to add to this discussion? Yeah, to, um, Murray's comment there about not, you know, looking at the product sector too, we see sustainability in the way uh, consumer products are now being developed, right? Um, you're using re renewables, recyclables, um, looking at their carbon emissions on, you know, their transport modes, their shipping modes. So we see a lot of that uh, innovation happening and uh, it's exciting to see even, you know, I, I just read about the trucking industry and how that's transforming now. Um, so even in the product sector, I think, you know, we on the consumer end, we see consumers consuming brands that have a sustainability component to them. And that is only growing. Um, so that's, I, I just wanted to add that on. 
Yeah, and I know Candace from from some of our really early day discussions. You know, we both kind of like coalesced around this idea that why are, is there so much swag out there that nobody wants? You know, <laughs> like oh, that drives us crazy. Like you go to yeah. a conference and you get your bag full of stuff that's going into the landfill just because somebody needs to put their um, right. logo on it. So I know Candace is going to solve that problem for us eventually yeah. as well. We're, we're gonna we're gonna be giving to charity yeah. instead of <laughs> instead of getting cups and glasses and yeah. pens. And but stuff. that's another really great point is it's very hard to find truly biodegradable products. Mm -hmm. And you read the small print and you realize that it might be compostable but only in a commercial facility which may not exist. And so I think that's another really big issue. And again, I come back to my economist point about subsidies, because I'm hearing from some companies like Mitsubishi Chemicals, they've actually developed fully biodegradable products, but the price point isn't there because we keep subsidizing fossil fuels. And it comes back to Mari's point about the importance of integrating the incentives and the regulatory dimension to this. So we all need to keep on to policymakers. If we keep incentivizing the wrong things, we're gonna keep getting the wrong things. Mm -hmm. So I personally would love, if anybody knows of anything that exists right now, I would absolutely love to change because the energy that goes into both creating the packaging and then destroying the packaging is huge. Absolutely. And that kind of brings us to the next question, which is around entrepreneurship and sustainability and the intersection between the two. Of course, I'm a big believer in entrepreneurship and its ability to solve all our problems in the, in the world um, from, you know, economic, uh, you know, empowerment to sustainability issues. So, you know, I'd love to get your thoughts on this intersection between entrepreneurship and sustainability. Um, are we seeing more of that? What kind of, what does the future look like there if we can kind of paint the picture uh, of these things coming together and hopefully really working on real world problems for us and, and making money at the same time? People need to make money, right? We can't all exist in, in um, you know, economies that, that are not sustainable either. So. Uh, I think that's, you know, that kind of double bottom line approach is going to be really important for the future of, of both of these, you know, these things. So um, comments about that. Go ahead, Amanda. I can see you have something to say. <laughs> I wanted to jump in because I have some really interesting data points looking at both Candace and Lauren. And I was yeah. very honored to be Lauren's mentor and learned so much from her. It was just incredibly uplifting. And having her you know, speak on a number of international panels for us with such good feedback. Women are more likely as entrepreneurs to embrace sustainability. So there's been two major studies, one by Foreign Policy and one by the International Finance Corporation. And they show that women more than men are embracing sustainability as entrepreneurs. And I'm so grateful to you, Shanoa, and Blue Startups for being a partner with us in the We Empower United Nations Sustainable Development Goal Challenge. Even though there are only 12 countries in the world where women entrepreneurs have a level playing field with their male counterparts, mm -hmm. we have so many more women who are really uplifting the sustainable development goals through their businesses. So I just wanted to say a big shout out to Candice and Lauren and the other women entrepreneurs who need support given the playing field is not yet level. And mm -hmm. thank you to all you do, the brilliant work you do at Blue Startups. Yes, I agree with you there. I do think, um, thankfully, women are oftentimes involved in solving real problems for us. And also, of course, my biased opinion, uh, more competent in doing so. So <laughs> um, that's why we're most- Must be Murray's turn. Yeah, Murray, what do you say about that? No, um, I'd love to hear comments again on this intersection between entrepreneurship and sustainability. Where does the future lead us there? Well, I'll throw out an idea. I had a guy actually in my office just a few days ago that runs a private equity fund that is focused on climate change sort of avoidance or mitigation type solutions. So he's purely focused on that. And I, I try to give him a few examples of companies he should look at in Hawaii. And the overall theme was that 
the major push of sustainability, the major push, whether it's renewable electricity or electric vehicles or nature-based solutions, a lot of the major pushes are fairly obvious. Where the entrepreneurs can usually do well is they find something that's one step derivative of that, meaning not the, not the main push, but something that's just off to the side of that that will be related to it. And since you already mentioned it, Chanel, I mentioned Volta, they're not going to start another Tesla. They're not going to start an EV company. They're like, okay, people are going to need to charge. Okay, but people know about charging. What are we going to do? So let's combine advertising with charging, and we can do those together and put them in high traffic areas. You take a company, another local company like Shifted Energy, it's like, okay, we've got massive intermittent renewables. So wind and solar, the sun's not always shining, the wind's not always blowing. So we need more grid services to balance the grid. And so they have these smart water heaters that can be grid interactive and store energy, release energy, kind of be used as a, as a way of almost like a battery to everyone's house using the hot water heater. So that's one step derivative. They didn't want to start a new solar company or a new wind company, but what else do you need? You need grid services. What else could you do? Smart water heater. So the one step derivative approach from the main thrust is often, I think, where the entrepreneurs can have a special advantage because the main thrust, again, EVs or renewable energy or nature-based solutions, the big companies, the big existing players know about that. They're pursuing it, right? You're not going to beat out Tesla or someone else that's doing EVs, mm -hmm. but you take the one step derivative and you can be successful and still make a real difference. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. Unless, of course, you're Rivian for, for some reason. <laughs> Who's got this, you know, you can't explain that. But, um, yeah. Other comments on entrepreneurship and sustainability? Yeah, Lauren, go ahead. I was just going to build up with what Murray's saying, because, yeah, I do think that they're identifying where the gaps are and where you can actually propel some of the, I guess, the greater movement that you find is, is, is stalling, making real action. Uh, you know, for example, I think, um, you know, what, what we're finding is we work with cities and not uncommonly, you know, we see that they're still operating on paper-based systems and have inefficient ways that they're trying to manage programs. And we're really just consolidating, um, you know, everything that they need to do while also increasing accessibility to these solutions to their customers. That really is just all about pro uh, propelling and adding value to their program that otherwise be, you know, more or less sitting in a bit of a stalemate. And, on, and going back to what we were talking about, we really need action today you know we cannot be um, complacent and then going back to our leadership and government i think there also needs to be entrepreneurship and innovation in these sectors as well i mean we have this great opportunity with the infrastructure bill and anyone who knows anything about infrastructure especially in water it'll sit around for the next hundred years we better get it right this time um and so you know in this and this and to the point of you know, mimicking the renewable energy industry. I want to see some federal policies coming out. Where can we get tax credits for people to install green infrastructure on their properties? Where, how can that trickle down to the state level? Um, and then more importantly, the real action is going to be on the local level. So I think entrepreneurs need to think about those different scales and they may not be able to create those policies. Um, but I, I guess my point being is there are, by having those policies, it creates more innovation in the space, um, like renewable energy space, pretty much boomed because of those incentive programs, right? Mm -hmm. um, so if we're talking about be, really seriously about rebuilding an economy, rebuilding infrastructure, it's going to come from top down, but also innovative ideas coming up that can hopefully investors and otherwise will, will put their money behind. Mm -hmm. Amanda, yeah, I, thought, too, so I, I did want to throw that in there too. I, she is an amazing human that I was <laughs> super thrilled to have worked with at Blue Startups, uh -huh. I guess, you know, for <laughs> Any of those who are thinking about Blue Startups, you get amazing mentors um, like you're seeing here today. So just want to put that plug in too. Awesome. Yeah, I thought it's interesting. The infrastructure bill is even so named the infrastructure bill as opposed to the green economy bill or any such thing, right? They, you know, politically, they almost had to hide that fact, right? Which is, um, which speaks a lot to kind of where we're at, unfortunately, in, in the political environment. It's uh, we're, we're not there yet with the, the incentives aligned, um, but we're getting there. Candice, your, your thoughts on this topic. Yeah, and I wanna bounce off of Lauren here and say how amazing the um, Blue Network has been, the mentors and Shanoa and uh, co-founders and uh, in our founder cohort. Um, truly in the entrepreneurial space, I think currently, if you don't have a sustainability model, it's going to be hard for you to succeed. Um, so whatever product innovation you are doing, whatever tech innovation you are doing, 
Um, it's something that you have to start from the bottom to think about how that's going to be incorporated into your overall business model. Um, and then going on that on the social responsibility end, uh, we're seeing new data come out of 2021. So we saw post pandemic that giving has grown um, oh, year over year at 12%. The latest data from 2021 is showing 25% growth. So we know um, the millennial generation, the upcoming Gen Z's generation, they're really concerned and very socially conscious and aware and build into their portfolios a giving component. And that's giving to programs in your communities that support, you know, um, green gardens, that support education, that support the homeless, that support um, different social programs and social justice initiatives. And, you know, it's so funny because we started Give Space, let's say back um, the ideation phase, you know, late 2019, early 2020, and then the pandemic hit. And people would look at us like, you're crazy. What are you doing? You know, you're working on this thing about giving and social responsibility and the pandemic hit. And it was an awakening call for so many people. And now we're here at this, you know, catch point where we're seeing daily interruptions, you know, whether it's something climate related, whether it's a disaster, whether it's um, wars. And what we know is that during those times, you know, rather than, hate or disdain, we actually come together and show compassion and we want a better world for everyone together. So I think on that social responsibility end, we are seeing that uptick and uprise even from current corporations, how can they do better? And they're always looking at um, their social responsibility aspect. Yeah, I think Candice, you make a great point and that is something we do try to emphasize here at Blue Startups as well is that having a social responsibility strategy is not just for big corporations. I think a lot of people think that, right? Well, I don't have the resources, I don't have the, but it is important I think to, to think about it from day one. There's always something you can do. Maybe it's small in the beginning, but it being part of your story, it only basically helps you in business as well as you know helping the, the cause that you are working with. So I think it's really important to, to address it right up front and have it be a part of your plan right from the beginning. Um, all right, so I wanna open up for questions from our audience. If you have a question, you can put in the Q&A function or if you're feeling brave, you can raise your hand and come up on stage and ask it. Um, so, um, I have one question that says, uh, speaking of policy, what do you think of the 500 page proposed rule by SEC that came out yesterday for public companies to have climate change policies? Who wants to take that on? Murray. As a former uh, hedge fund and private equity guy in my life before Lupono, yeah, watching what the SEC does is always interesting. The principal problem you have with any negative externalities, whether it's pollution or it's a bad smell or it's you know garbage or emissions or whatever it might be, is oftentimes you don't know who done it. <laughs> when you don't know who did it, it's very easy to get sort of get away with it or just to ignore it. And having those disclosures out there uh, makes a lot of sense. Some people think that maybe the SEC is overstepping and, and almost acting like the EPA in this. But if you think about the SEC's role, the role is to make sure that public companies disclose material risks that their business is exposed to. And climate change is absolutely one of those. We need more transparency on the reporting. So I can't comment on the 500 pages. I'm not gonna pretend that I've read it. But I can tell you that uh, transparency and reporting and being aware of that allows people to track it, allows better activist investors to get involved. And it's, it's un I think it's undoubtedly a good thing. And if I can just add to that too, with COP26, there was a move to rationalize uh, standards, accounting standards for sustainability and climate globally. And that's gonna make it so much easier for everybody who's been trying to work out if they use the Global Reporting Initiative or if they use Carbon Disclosure Project. But I think it's really interesting just thinking about the Carbon Disclosure Project, which has kind of encouraged companies to disclose their carbon emissions by saying, well, if you don't disclose, we'll do it for you. Uh, the latest I heard was that they had over, companies with over $113 trillion of funds into, under management, which is, you know, must be upward of about 60% of the global economy, 
who were going to the carbon disclosure project and actually seeking that information. So as Murray so eloquently said, climate is a material risk, right? And that's why insurance companies and investors like BlackRock have kind of been leading the way. And now we have an international movement, not nearly fast enough, because it was very disappointing to see the COP26 uh, declaration watered down to talk about not eliminating fossil fuel subsidies, which is my total bugbear, but phasing down inefficient fossil fuel subsidies, which basically gives license to the politicians to continue. But I think it's really interesting looking at scope one, two, and three emissions. And we've just created a free tool, actually, that is open to any small business. And Chanel, I'm going to pass this to you to test with some of your entrepreneurs. And it's just a simple rubric to be able to measure scope one and two. And mm -hmm. then scope, which scope one being your own emissions, scope two being where you get your electricity from, and then scope three being employees and supply chain. And in the SEC proposed climate-related disclosures, they did actually include a mention of scope three. Now, imagine if you're a fossil fuel company and you're only doing scope one and two, your footprint probably doesn't look too bad. But if you have to look at scope three and all of the use of your product, that's going to significantly change. And if we start, if we ever get to the stage where we can tax polluter pays, well, let's get rid of the subsidies first, and then tax polluter pays, it could radically transform things. So for me, entrepreneurs who are in this intersection of the sustainability space are absolutely going to be the ones who are going to see their businesses take off. Mm -hmm. Those are great points. Any other comments on the SEC ruling that came out? No. All right. Um, again, if you have a question, you can put it in the Q&A function or you can raise your hand. Um, uh, another question here. Uh, Amanda mentioned Larry Fink earlier in the conversation. Earlier this week, he declared to, in his shareholder letter that the war in Ukraine is ending globalization. This should spur things like farm to table, smaller supply chains, etc., while disincentivizing dinosaur juice. Do each of you agree with him? And if so, do you see any specific opportunities arising as a result of lesser globalization? Who wants to comment on that? Well, I'll just say that as compared to the war in Ukraine, I would say probably COVID itself raised questions about globalization more than so far, so far more than the war. The war could eventually be bigger because all the stuff that we needed, whether it was PPE, uh, trying to get masks or mm -hmm. gowns or face shields, whatever, all came from countries who had their supply, their own factory shut down by COVID. And so suddenly you realize you can't get ventilators, you can't get any of the stuff that you need because it's all made in other countries. And that's sort of the price of going for the cheapest option. Going with globalization is economically efficient but it's dangerous in a disaster or in a crisis situation because you cannot have access to key things that you need in your own country because you're dependent on someone else. So it doesn't change the idea that globalization will still probably be economically efficient, but it does make you think about what's the backup plan when globalization goes wrong as in a pandemic or as in a war. Mm -hmm. uh, the other side of globalization, the sort of the positive side if Russia didn't sell products to the outside world, and if there wasn't all these economic ties between Russia and other countries, we wouldn't have the ability to exert the pressure that's being exerted right now on them for this, this unjust war. So there are some good things about globalization because you're less likely to do something you shouldn't do if someone can cut you off economically. Mm -hmm. that's Sorry, not too political for anyone. <laughs> no, no, I think that's that's an interesting point. I, I certainly hadn't thought of that, but you're absolutely right. It, it is a is a point of pressure that we can put. You know, the other thing, certainly from where I sit during during uh, the pandemic, globalization, maybe not with goods and services, but certainly with communication, became even more and more you know a common practice, right? And did as we mentioned earlier, reduce our need to get on a plane to see people, to, you know, be having every meeting in person, to get in our cars every two seconds and go from here to here to here. I think some of those, you know, are the good sides of uh, the quote unquote globalization or the flat earth that we've all experienced during the pandemic, right? So there, there's a positive to that too. Other thoughts on, on Eric's comment and question? 
about the Ukraine or globalization issues? Go ahead, I'll, Amanda. I'll just add to that. I think Murray yeah, gave a fantastic overview. But when we look at some of the geostrategic dimensions of this, the Nordstrom II pipeline, which Angela Merkel, before she left office, had signed Germany up to, has been cancelled. And interestingly, now there's this big question, well, shouldn't we be moving much faster to renewables, which are in situ? And the, the storage point that was raised earlier is a critical one. I guess we should give a, a plug to Hank and green hydrogen too. It was interesting to see Australian billionaire Andrew Forrest uh, has made the first export of hydrogen from Australia to Japan. Unfortunately, it was brown hydrogen. But if you're thinking about green hydrogen, both as a transport and a, an energy product, uh, we could be moving so much faster and there wouldn't be the same kind of dependence that there still is on Russia. And the EU will be dependent on Russia till at least 2030. So hopefully this will spur them to move much faster and that kind of localization Mm -hmm. of energy and creating a circular economy and that was one other thing I wanted to stress we're recognizing now we're going to need three planets by the time we have 10 billion people in 2050 and so without creating a different model from the cradle to grave we need a cradle to cradle or a circular model and that kind of model provides so much opportunity for local businesses as well. We still use this outmoded GDP, which is endless growth based on just, you know, accounting numbers. It was never meant to be used beyond the system of national accounting in the Second World War, and we're still using it. So that's why we're seeing now some countries with well-being budgets and different ways of measuring, which is really more related to well-being for people rather than just endless numbers. Yeah, absolutely. I, I, I love the, the like gross national happiness uh, metrics that they do in Bhutan and um, really wish we were adopting that along with a lot of other things they do in Bhutan, which I think are fabulous. Uh, <laughs> that is like a great model for many things. In fact, renewable energy is one of them and sustainability and uh, decentralized energy. Every little house there has solar on its roof. You know, it's a uh, it's quite an interesting place as a as a test market for lots of things. Um, other comments about this, either the the globalization versus kind of localization issues. I would just add. I mean, even just looking at more broadly, I mean, when we talk about resiliency, it is about diversifying, you know, where we're getting our supplies and our resources. And so, I mean, you know, I don't think globalization is going away. Um, but again, to Amanda's point and, and I mean, Murray's point too, I mean, I, I think, you know, we, when we think about trying to do things locally, I think is where we can, can generally uh, put our best, best money forward and in investing into companies and the food sources and the things that don't have to travel so far that maybe don't, can be made locally. Um, and I just think like, you know, it's the same kind of problem when we rely on large centralized infrastructure and something goes awry, you know, we're all kind of, in it together or in, in it to go down where we had distributed systems um mm -hmm. we're more we're more resilient and i think um i think just moving forward on, on a greater thought on everything is how do we build you know a more resilient system which might mean more decentralization and we might have globalization but we also have other eggs in our basket mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. yeah it's about it's about striking that balance right Candice, did you have a comment on that? Yeah, I just wanted to comment on a micro level because I think everyone's um, really touched on the macro. And I love Amanda's comment here where she um, touched on the rare earth minerals too. And I, I think, you know, natural resources, um, when you look at on the macro level, they come from certain areas. So I think on that front, globalization is not going to go away. Um, but when you look microly at um, social responsibility, we see a lot of grassroots work, right, um, within your local communities. And that is the demand we are seeing, um, not from these, you know, large entities that are operating in, you know, several different countries, but really those localized units that can uh, connect directly with their communities and know and have the resources built in right there and do the work that's boots on the ground. Um, for example, in Ukraine, I had, you know, through some of my networks where they wanted to support them with certain, um, you know, gear uh, for their soldiers that 
And that was, that was a challenge because you had to look at the different routing systems that needed to go through to get those supplies there. So it, it was really interesting to see this on so many different fronts. And I, and I love um, every point that um, the panelists made here. So just wanted to add that as well. Great, thanks, Candice. Um, we have a couple of other questions here. They're they're pretty specific, so I don't know if anybody wants to uh, to chime in. Uh, we have a comment about the maritime industry and working to lower marine uh, impacts. Um, I you know I think that's if anybody has a comment on that. I think it is interesting how I'll say relatively far behind it seems the maritime industry is right in um, going electric and things like that. So uh, any comments about the maritime industry and where maybe some good news <laughs> is to be found there also? Merck has been doing a lot of work here. And as far as I know, and hopefully our audience member who is way more knowledgeable, I'm sure, will be able to correct me. But I understand that they have been really setting the industry standard as a Danish company. And many of the Nordics are we know that the 60% uh, EV ownership, for example, in Norway, many of them, the Nordics are trying to set policy frameworks that are much more sustainability oriented. Uh, so I'm hoping that this is going to be a trend in the right direction, because I know it's one of the toughest ones to crack. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, any other comments on that? Just one more quick comment. If you look at, there's a really interesting graph, and I wish I had it handy, but there, it shows the amount of emissions per mile or per 100 miles or something like that from each of the different modes of transportation. And the, the, the airline one, the bar is like crazy, right? It goes all the way across the page, right? And mm -hmm. then it goes to, you know, cars and trucks and obviously rail is, is, is efficient. And it, towards the very bottom is maritime, meaning that per mile mm -hmm. or per 100 miles, the emissions are actually lower because you think about it, the water is doing so much of the work for you in, in carrying that, that load, just like the rails on a train do a lot of work for you, reducing friction and everything else. So it's sort of one of the most efficient on a per mile basis, but that also means there's less economic push to get more efficient. So airlines, if you look at, you know, we've had to have EPA standards for cars where they keep having these mileage increases that you have to get uh, to meet standards for cars. They haven't really had to do that so much for airplanes because they're such energy hogs. If you look at planes from 50, 25, 10, five years ago, they're continually getting much more efficient because there's a huge economic pressure to do so. The maritime industry faces that to a much lesser extent, so they're going to be a slower adopter, although I appreciate what Bill's saying, that they're getting on board now. And uh, linking it back to the comment about green hydrogen, since a lot of those vessels can run, run on liquefied natural gas, it could be renewable gas, could be green hydrogen someday. So I think that's coming, mm -hmm. but uh, I think I just want to make the economic point. There's a huge economic pressure to get efficient on airlines, less mm -hmm. economic pressure to get efficient on, on shipping because it's more efficient. That's yeah, that's very interesting. That explains a lot. Thank you. <laughs> um, any other comments on, on that or the, the mobility issues? Sounds as though Michael has really got something to bring to blue startups. So Michael, you should apply. <laughs> All That's <right>. amazing. <laughs> um, and a uh, question here from Daniel. I'm gonna, Dean, gonna skip your question because it's very specific, but hopefully uh, maybe one of the panelists will wanna type you an answer if they have a thought. Um, uh, Daniel's question is, how do we globally take action re regarding AI? There needs to be more regulations and global protocols for AI usage and allowance. I don't know, what do we mean by AI in this context? I'm thinking artificial intelligence, so that's my world, but <laughs> is there something else that we're talking about here? Anyone? Danielle? You wanna I'll, I'll jump in briefly, just because I recently read a book um, and the author whose name I'm embarrassingly forgetting right now actually came to the Hawaii Executive Collaborative Conference just a, a month or so ago, but it's called A World Without Work. Mm -hmm. And it goes through with the advance of AI and the ability of machines to replace humans. Somewhat it's an old story because every time there's a wave of automation, whether it's taking automobiles from handmade things to a factory, you know, robotic assembly, there's always a lot of fear that jobs are going to go away because of that. And the author basically makes the point that, yes, that is an old argument, but with AI, it's becoming more and more real because the, the sheer number of things that a machine with AI can replace a human at 
you know, driving a car nowadays, or they even they trained a, they trained a software program to identify skin cancer more accurately than top doctors could. Um, it, so there's there's so many things that AI can do. There is a concern that there'll be less need for people, less need for labor, and then you have all the returns going to those who hold the capital. You got all the return going to those who own the automation, the machines, the AI, and the common laborer doesn't really have a job in the future. Is the fear. And so there's various policies, which we don't have time to go into now that could address that or deal with some of that, but it is a real concern and it's becoming more real, the better AI gets. So it's both a blessing and a concern, I think at the same time. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes, uh, other comments on AI? Yeah, go ahead, Lauren. I was gonna say, and I agree. I, I think to Murray's point that certainly there should, we should be um, just like how our data is being used, right? Um, AI is kind of the next level of that. Um, I mean, the, I guess on the flip side of things as well, if we think about how we maximize our human capacity in our brains, if we maybe can have these computers solving some of the basics and then helping us creatively think how we use that information. Um, and I completely agree there needs to be some boundaries um, to create that, um, especially equity moving forward. Um, so I think it'll be an interesting next decade or two, how this transforms. I, do, I will probably hopefully see some policies that create the boundaries but I think as like, you know, putting on like an engineer's hat or what have you, if you didn't have to spend all your time solving one aspect of a problem, but really could just quickly use data to really be creative about building out solutions, which is, I think, you know, especially in that world, that's what you're really supposed to be out there doing um, and being more efficient of how you're getting creative. Then I think that human capacity goes, you know, comes back to, to us rather than the computer. Um, granted, I could be wrong. There could be a very smart, our AI unit out there that is a great decision tool, but whether or not they'll have the emotional intelligence, um, you know, that's forthcoming, I suppose. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Other comments on this topic? No more? Okay. Amanda, you want to say one more thing? Go I was just going to chime in and support what Lauren had said. The, that point about emotional intelligence or making morally informed decisions. But then again, there's a lot of humans who don't do that either. But when we're seeing some of the potential use of AI with uh, bio, I, I don't know if some of you follow uh, Yuval Harari's work, and he's been saying this is one of the big dangers. So AI has got wonderful applications, but there's always a flip side. And if we start using, in the way that we've seen social media, be able to manipulate information and hence uh, the outcomes of a number of things have, yeah, that if, if they start to begin to use biometrics, if you're using your Apple Watch and that information begins to be used for something else, there's a slippery slope, so. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yes, but uh, it can be life-saving as well, so, you know. There's always the, the flip side of these issues. Well, as you can tell from our discussion, we could sit down and talk to each one of these amazing panelists for at least an hour. I just want to pick their brains there. They have so much information and knowledge, and I feel really stupid <laughs> talking to all of you today, but that's a good thing. Um, so again, to our audience, thank you for tuning in today. Uh, this webinar was recorded and will be put on our YouTube channel if you missed any part of it. Um, our applications for cohort 14 are open. Our website is bluestartups.com. The deadline for these applications is April 1st, so do get your apps in soon. Uh, our cohort will run this summer. It will be six weeks in person here in Honolulu, six weeks online and one week in San Francisco. Um, and we look forward to hopefully talking with all of you. Thanks everyone for tuning in. I see many familiar names of our mentor network and other community members. So thanks a lot for your time and attention today. Big round of applause to our panel, Marie, Candice, Lauren, and Amanda. Thank you so much. Aloha everyone. Thanks everyone. Hello everybody. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Aloha.